not sure that I was really prepared for the scrutiny that you're put under. I felt as if I could motivate players and that was that I, I felt that that was a strength, not only a strength of mine, but I felt it was a real strength of a manager. Before this episode starts, I have a small favor I need to ask you. Since the channel started, over 90% of those that have watched have not subscribed. So if you've liked any of my podcast episodes or any of the content on this channel, please hit the subscribe button down below. It helps the channel grow. The bigger the channel, the bigger the guests. Thank you and enjoy this episode. So Martin O'Neill, welcome to the podcast. How are you, Christy? You okay? My, my first question is... Um, I'm going to kind of go back to the beginning, Martin. So what was life growing up in Northern Ireland during a, a, a tricky period in terms of politics? How was that for you? Okay, right. Um, well, I'm, um, I, my early days in, uh, in the village that I uh, am from were, were actually fine, I have to say, Chris, really, really fine for this reason, that the troubles, the troubles really did not start until around about uh, uh, 1969. So, uh, and I grew up in the 50s, which uh, I know seems ancient to you, I must admit. But <laughs> nevertheless, that's that's life. And um, and I lived a, uh, I lived in a, a provincial village, and uh, Catholics and Protestants shared a lot of things at that stage. So the troubles, if there were, uh, the troubles, of course, became very famous because of 30 years of them starting in around about 1969. But essentially, uh, sporadic outbursts of, uh, of, of trouble were really confined mostly to border areas. I'm talking about the border between the north and the south. And in cities, while there was probably always sectarianism, uh, it it was not rife at that time, or didn't appear to be. And of course, some with Catholics and Protestants uh, living together in um, in uh, in Kilray. In fact, my father was a barber, and he had as many Protestant clients as he did have Catholics. So from a, from a, from that viewpoint, a life was actually reasonably idyllic for 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 me for uh, being a, from a Catholic uh, nationalist background. And did that upbringing influence you in terms of other sports? I, I can imagine the GAA as, a, as an influence. I feel very, from... very strongly. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, my family were steeped in it. I have to say, my older brothers played for uh, for the Derry Senior Team, which was great. And of course, my uh, my father used to take me to an awful lot of games. Uh, and then I grew up with uh, basically a loving Gaelic football and uh, and playing it myself. So I ended up. Um, yeah, it was it was terrific. Really terrific. Who was very influential on you during your your your, your younger years in terms of playing football? You mentioned. Are you talking yeah. about soccer now? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the soccer. So obviously, my point yeah. is is that you've obviously been exposed to a range of different sports, especially in yeah. the Irish community. Why football, and how did that become apparent? Okay. Who yeah. Was yeah. Influential well, I, there? Yes. Exactly. I um I watched uh, on someone else's television the uh, European Cup final in 1960 because we did not have a TV or our family didn't have a TV <laughs> at that time. And I watched the Cup final and Real Madrid in black and white were playing against the German team Eintracht Frankfurt and uh, they won 7-3. And Puskas, this player, the Hungarian player called Puskas scored four goals and another uh, player called De Stefano scored three. And of course, I'm smitten because in black and white television, a team wearing all white Looked absolutely immaculate. It looked like <laughs> angels, and uh, so really Puskas. And then, of course, my brother, my older brother, who was at university at the time, uh, came back one particular summer to say that he had read an autobiography of Puskas, and Puskas used to keep a tennis ball on his foot, tapping the ball up on his foot, and he used to be able to, be able to keep it without it uh, hitting the ground about two hundred times. And of course, I used to, and he said, "You try that now." And of course, it fell off my foot after about two or three, but I was determined to do it. So when he came back for, um, it would have been for Halloween, which was a couple of months later from university, I was able to keep the ball up 200 times. And I was about uh, nine or 10 at the time. So from that viewpoint, uh, that, you know, Puskas, you would have to say, ha had a big influence. And of course, I, I, I genuinely believed that if I could keep the ball up 200 times, I'm going to be as good as Puskas. Unfortunately, that might not have materialized. However, <laughs> still, he was still very influential in my upbringing. I read, I read that you were a Sunderland fan as well. Was that correct? Growing up, yeah, I did. I was Sunderland, yeah, because they had uh, they had a couple of Irish players playing for them. Uh, in fact, they had three. They had a lad uh, called Martin Harvey, 
Uh, he was, I think, from Belfast. Uh, they had a fellow called John Crosn who came from Derry City, and they had my my absolute hero was Charlie Hurley, who was from Cork, but had lived all of his life, other than a couple of months, uh, in England. And uh, so, yes, I was a big a big Sunderland fan, and of course, remarkably and ironically, one of the players that Sunderland had was a one Brian Clough. And um, I didn't realize how influential he was going to be in my in my life, never mind my career. So let's talk about that transition then. So playing for Nottingham Forest under Brian Clough, how did that come about and and um, how was right. that well, transition for you? OK, well, I, I became a professional footballer in late 1971 uh, with Nottingham Forest. Brian Clough did not arrive until 19 to January 75. So I was a player at Nottingham Forest as were a couple of other lads who went on to have really good careers, like John Robertson, Ian Boyer, Tony Woodcock, and Viv Anderson. Viv Anderson being the first black player to play for England as well, too. So these boys, we were all, I think, I think we were all fine players. But of course, with Brian Clough arriving in late 75, he changed our lives. And, um, and we had phenomenal success, which was not overnight, as people seem to think. Brian Clough had... Um, had a tough enough time managing us, I think, until uh, Peter Taylor, his assistant manager, came and joined him about 16 months later. And of course, then success after success followed for a number of years. And it was uh, it was just a, a super ride we were on that uh, ended up winning promotion to the champ, winning the what would be called the Premier League now, two European Cups, which are called the Champions League and a number of League Cup victories as well, too. So it was a fantastic ride. What was he like as a manager, Martin? And oh, did you, learn... have, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have, I, I, I don't think you would have uh, enough time here to describe him. <laughs> uh, he was um, simply fantastic, fantastic manager, charismatic character, uh, big news as well at that time as well, too. Remember, we're going back to not that many, that not that many channels, on on television, so Brian Clough was uh, he was a, a major character not just in football, but he used to appear quite regularly on uh, the Michael Parkinson chat show. So uh, that's that's how famous he was. You mentioned at the beginning that you watched um, Real Madrid and the the white jerseys, and they were very influential on you. Um, in terms of going into those European Cup finals, how did you cope with that in terms of pressure and? kind of everything that you grew up as a kid looking at and, and wanting to be. How did you cope with well, that going into those, into those well, matches? Okay. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a good point. By the time, by the time that we had reached the European cup finals in 1970 and the one that I played the whole game in in 1980, I had, I had plenty of experience then. So obviously nervous because you're playing in such a big game, nervous because you want to win it. That's the most important thing. And nervous because the opposition are good as well too. But I, I think that third one would probably be um, would have been uh, less in my mind before. We always felt at Forest that if we were strong enough ourselves, that we could overcome teams. Uh, but had this happened to me when I was much much younger, I think that my I think that the way I would have coped with it might have been different in this sense because I think that I might not. Let's just say by some by some miracle or other, Nottingham Forest had gone on to achieve these things when I was 20, 21 and 22. I'm not so sure with much less experience behind me that I would have coped as well as I think that I coped by that time. And I'm never I'm never really sure that you, you cope all that well with them. The coping, the coping, you feel as if you've coped if you've won. If you've lost the game, you don't feel as if you've coped at all. Did you, you mentioned um the manager, did he kind of take the pressure off you? Did he kind of motivate you in certain yeah, ways yeah, to yes, kind of think yes, differently it, going into those yeah, games? I, yeah? I, think I, I, I hear this um, common talk now with managers saying well, that, uh, oh, they're taking pressure off the players. Um, I'm never sure. Brian Clough probably did in many aspects. But he didn't really necessarily take pressure off us. He tried to relax us as much <clears> as anything else. And... Um, and comments that he would make both um, uh, pre-match and post-match are always designed, I, I think, with possibly himself in, in mind, I must admit. But he was, again, so charismatic that whatever he was saying to the journalists, 
And of course, life has changed greatly since then. Whatever he was saying, the journalists would print it. You know, if, if he turned around and said, uh, let's say he was doing an interview on Tuesday and saying, well, by the way, tomorrow will not be Wednesday, but it'll likely be Thursday, that would have been printed and everybody and uh, he would have had the journalist believing him. So I'm <laughs> exaggerating to to make the point to you. you know, where, um, but he did, um, because most of the journalists really wanted to talk about him anyway, it, was, it wasn't that difficult for him to take pressure off us because uh, he didn't mind the limelight himself. What was the best piece of advice you ever received as a football player, Martin? Is there anything that stands out on reflection of your, your time playing? Um, that that is a, that's a that's really a good point. I, I you know what I'm not so sure that anybody just gave me one uh, one actual piece of advice that has stood the test of time. Brian Clough taught a lot of a lot of um, uh, coaching points to us that have stood the test of time, and considering that he has not really thought about as being a great coach, he's considered a great motivator. But I think that he uh, I think his coaching points. Uh, were as good as any I've ever uh, as I've ever listened to. So um, so advice advice. Um, uh, I think that um, his advice to to us generally was, it's a simple game, a really simple game. You can complicate it as much as you want to, and if you do complicate it, it's your own fault. And it's really a simple game. Uh, you uh, you try and get the ball, you try and win the ball. Then you try and get it to one of your uh, one of your uh, fellow players, and then if that fellow player happens to be better at doing some things than you, then you get it to him more often. And <laughs> his advice was actually quite simple, but um, but in terms of in terms of what he um, uh, listen, essentially he taught us the game. Both both um, if you talk about uh, particular individual points and the overall view of a game. So he, he, he taught us the game. In terms of being exposed to those personalities, such as Brian Clough, did, did, did you ever think, I want to be a football manager? Never really did. Not at all. No, I, 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 it, wasn't, it wasn't ever part of my thinking. Of course, we, I think all, our, all the players in Nottingham Forest knew that we were in the midst of a, a fantastic manager, but I don't think it, it didn't... It, it wasn't anything that I yearned to do, but I realized then, in fact, I was, um, when I had injured myself and was no longer playing, I um, accidentally ran into Peter Taylor, uh, Brian Clough's ex-assistant, who had retired from the game. And he was the one that put management into my head because he actually paid me a, a, a bit of a compliment by saying, uh, you disappoint me because I thought that you would go into management. Uh, he said this to me and um, and he said that he, th he was disappointed that I hadn't tried to go into management. So after that, after this little um, uh, little tete-a-tete -tete with him, I, I decided then to start applying for jobs because he had put the notion that I might be actually half decent at it. So really that, and that was after I'd finished playing. So it wasn't something that I had ever planned to go in to do uh, af uh, immediately after playing because I hadn't really thought about it. In terms of that transition from from playing to, to management, did you did you have to kind of learn on the job? Did you were you a mentor? Did you uh, did you kind of gain experience by by going into the football clubs? I'm just intrigued to kind of no, it's, figure it's out a, how you work yeah, that out. Very good point. No, I I I did not I did not one have a mentor. Well, although Brian Clough, you might turn around and say was one. I didn't go and ask people for advice. I learned, I I decided very early on that I that I would whatever personality that I had, that I would, I would, um, I would uh, use that personality. I felt that, and things that I had learned, which are very, very important, that, that even from the great, great Brian Clough, some of the things that I felt that he did, I wouldn't necessarily have agreed with. Uh, and uh, so I, I would have definitely taken points of his, but I would try and uh, put them into my, to my own thinking and really be, and I know it sounds so cliched, but really be my own person to to have my own personality. Because if I start copying people, either like Brian Clough, you're going to, in the moment of 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 decision making, you're going to think in your mind. Let's just say something is cropping up in the dressing room at half time in a game, and you're starting to think, "Oh, how would Brian Clough deal with this?" By the time that moment's gone, 
it's really gone. The players are starting to think, well, hold on. What's he stuttering and stammering over? So be your own person. You'll have learned the things, have your own personality. And mine was, I felt as if I could motivate players. And that was, that. I, I felt that that was a strength, not only a strength of mine, but I felt it was a real strength of a manager that he's got to be able to motivate players. You work in the assumption you should really have an idea about the game, if you've, particularly if you've played it. And but motivation was I felt was was really strong, and in that sense, I I kind of learned on the job, as it were. So authenticity and self awareness is is very important to you in terms of that makeup of of who you are. Absolutely, absolutely, spot on, spot on with both words. Absolutely, yeah. Definitely. Did you find did did you find yourself having to bring people in in regards to maybe that delegation? So if you were very good at motivation, did you have to kind of maybe bring people in on board to, to kind of help with other aspects of the game? Did you find that as a, okay, as a practice right. going forward? Yes, eventually you do. You you build a team around you, which I did. I, I But in my early days of managing at Wigan Wanderers, I was doing all myself. I was doing the coaching. I was doing the, um, essentially doing the uh, coaching, particularly when the, when the team were in the, um, were in the Vauxhall Conference, which is the league below the league at the at, at the time, we were yeah. we were desperately trying to get in, uh, getting uh, into the football league, and um, Wickham had been uh, a very very good amateur team, uh, years years gone past, but you stepping into the football league and becoming a professional team was something that I felt that I needed a hand. Then at that stage, initially did it myself. Secondly. Then started to get a bit of a hand because you, I wasn't a great delegator at the stage, but I had to learn to be able to do that. Then you get a really good team around you. I got an excellent coach in Steve Walford, brilliant assistant manager in um, in John Robertson, goalkeeping coach, and eventually in Seamus McDonough. But really, we were we were we were a, a strong unit, and uh, and that's important. I must admit to have some people around you that you trust implicitly and you know that will not be going behind your back and saying different things that, you know, that um, that you might have been talking about in the privacy of your own room. In terms of the landscape of your career, so you mentioned Wickham Wanderers, Leicester, and then Celtic. In comparison to, obviously, if you think of Celtic in, compar- in comparison to Wickham Wanderers, a, a massive football club, an institution, how mm-hmm. did you... How did you cope with the, the the pressures and the demand at at Celtic? You mentioned your upbringing in a, in a Northern Ireland, being a being a, um, a Catholic as well, and, and and everything that comes with it in terms of your personality and makeup and upbringing. Um, in terms of being the manager of Celtic, did you feel pressure at all? And how did you cope with that? Of, of, of course, yes, because I don't think you're really prepared. I should have been in many aspects. I say should have been. I, I knew what Celtic was all about. I knew, obviously, for, from being Northern Ireland, if you're brought up a Catholic, chances are you were supporting uh, Celtic. If you're a Protestant, chances are you're supporting Rangers. So I knew all about the Celtic Rangers um, rivalry, things that you see. But I'm not really sure now, even now, as I think I'm talking to you, I'm not sure that I was really prepared for for uh, the scrutiny that you're put under. I mean, I mean, I used to think that uh, football was about the back pages, but when Celtic, when Celtic and Rangers are up there in Scotland, it's not just the back pages. It's not just the second back pages. You could go back to the the middle pages of of any given um, any given red top, and you find yourself, geez, this is this is incredible. So <laughs> scrutiny, and and, uh, and not just not just a match, not just a pre match, but almost a, a daily scrutiny about uh, about what's happening. And I, you know, they 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 say that. Uh, Barcelona and Real Madrid have the same problems all the time, mm-hmm. but nothing seemed to prepare you for that. So, uh, I, yeah, uh, would I have changed my mind about taking the job? Not really. It was a natural privilege to becoming manager of Celtic, but they'd been in the doldrums for for quite some considerable time. So I felt as if I could I could turn it round. Well, I was hoping that I could turn it round, obviously, and um, and lucky enough that uh, I was able to do so. But again, I, I take your point entirely. I'm not really sure that I was I was prepared for the sort of over scrutiny that uh, that that a manager or some of the players would have had during that time. Does that does that get exhausting, Martin? Because you mentioned 
in a, in a different sense, Madrid, Barcelona. I remember reading Guardiola's book and he said, in terms of the political issues in Catalonia, it gets exhausting being the manager of Barcelona. Did you ever feel that at Celtic, that it can be exhausting <clears> of the, the demand? And you mentioned that the, the newspapers. I'm, I'm intrigued to right. hear if that impacted your your, your mental health at all or, or okay. anything along right. those lines. Okay, a, a good point. I the, the, the most important thing is not not to allow exhaustion to take place. You can be yeah. exhausted the minute the final game of the season is over. You can maybe you maybe think to yourself, I listen, I'll get a week in Portugal or something and recharge. But you cannot allow yourself to be exhausted. And I mean this really, uh, particularly up the uh, up at up at Celtic. I do. I actually, I I think this uh, applies to. Uh, to a job anywhere, but you can't allow yourself to be exhausted because the minute you do, the minute you start thinking it, you will be it. You'll be exhausted. You will st- You will find reasons not to do some things. You've got to, I just feel the one thing that I do, I did have, I felt I, I had two things. I had a lot of energy and a lot of enthusiasm. I've, I've had that, you know, all my time. So I cannot let any of those things win. Bad results can knock you. Of course they can. They can severely damage you if you're, but you and I must admit that this seems um, a contradiction. Is that I still I did mull over defeats for a lot longer than I perhaps I should have done, but a minute the minute that say let's say Saturday you got beaten in the game up up at uh, in Scotland by Tuesday I had to forget about it. So I had a long weekend of mulling over things, <laughs> and I'm fortunate. I'm, I'm one of those managers who takes it home with me as well. Too, I can't leave it to the side. Never been able to do that. But by the time they come round again, I, 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 I'm, I'm ready to go. And I, you have to be really up for it. So I didn't allow myself to be exhausted by the time. Plenty of time to be exhausted, as I said to you, when you're yeah. lying on a beach somewhere in Mallorca or Portugal for a week or so or something <laughs> like that. That's fine. Did did you, with that position at Celtic, did you have to kind of take your emotion away from the role? Just because obviously you, you mentioned that growing up you you were a Celtic mm. fan. Did you have to, have to kind of take that emotional element out? Because you know if you make decisions with emotion, that they, they could have, obviously jeopardize the way <clears throat> things plan out. I'm just intrigued on your leadership and management. There, it's a very very good point. It's a very good point indeed. Maybe maybe involuntarily, I I might have been doing that, but I never felt during the time. I did. I did make emotional decisions. You know, I I absolutely did. Um, my assistant manager called John Robertson, a brilliant, brilliant footballer. John used to call it gut instinct, and you know, I did make. I made. I made a lot of gut instinct decisions on things, and I just. And it wasn't one of those where I felt as if. And I have said this before, and it's worth repeating. I didn't. I never made a right decision in the sense. I, when I made a decision, I tried to make it right. If that was the if that was the case, I couldn't. There's no such thing. I never felt as if there's a right or wrong decision, unless it's something absolutely staring you straight in the face. But uh, overall, no, I did make a made a gut instinct, a lot of gut instinct decisions, and and I would call them possibly emotional in in, in many aspects. I I I tried many a time to divorce myself from that and just step back again and think about it again. But it's sometimes just to feel as if, yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm getting involved in that. And some of my managerial uh, uh, decisions, like going to, going to manage Sunderland, for instance, that was totally emotional. So, uh, you know, I wanted to go heart, heart ruling head, you know, you look at Sunderland, you know, and, and, um, and the team hadn't been good for quite a number of years, but I thought, yeah, I'm I'm wanting to manage it because of my boyhood team, uh, in that sense. So yes, so I I have to say, so I don't know whether I disappoint you in my answer, but I did make <laughs> a lot of the most emotional decisions. So obviously at Leicester City, you win the League Cup, Celtic the, the UEFA the cup run in Seville, Aston Villa as well, the, the the League Cup final against Manchester United. How would you deal with the highs and lows of football? Um, I'm just intrigued uh, yeah. to how you okay. cope with that. Well, it, it it it's interesting because you know there's there's there have been a lot of changes taking place. I mean, my career now, both as a player and as a manager, spans 50 years. So I've seen a lot of changes that have taken place in the game. And if you're talking even about mental health issues and things that you see that are big, that um, that uh, would have been um, would have not been considered in uh, in my certainly my early days of management and certainly never in, never in football you never you never felt that that it was never really talked about but i did have in my my experiences as a manager 
one or two players who did who who had uh, mental health issues. And I learned a great deal from them because I didn't really know that much about it. And it's, uh, and, um, and just listening to them and, and actually uh, and realizing that, uh, yeah, listen, it didn't matter how much money they might have been earning, that these, these lads would have a, 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 a problem or two. And it was, um, it was by listening to them that I started to learn a little bit more. And I must admit, I, I you know, I was, um, I, I didn't become aware until they talked me, talked me through them. And not for one minute that I consider myself a father figure, but the very fact is that they were prepared, these lads, to open up to me in a certain sense of, uh, as a manager, you know, I, I I did perhaps maybe take on that sort of more avuncular feeling uh, than anything else. But um, uh, but in terms of me dealing with with uh, yeah, the highs and lows of the game, yeah, the highs, the highs can be very high and the lows can be like like the nadir you know really really can be and and those moments i feel that uh, that you you just you have to get over you're hoping that you know you might get a little bit of help from from other people perhaps maybe family around but at the end of the day yes and there are regardless of how you manage and regardless of how successful you are you will have you will have a lot of low moments in your, in your time both as a player, but particularly as a manager, because you feel as if, you know, there's pressure. The pressure on you is to is to to have a winning team selfishly for yourself, but you feel as if you're dealing with a lot of people. As a player, you almost like you feel as if you're dealing with yourself. You know, of course, you have a manager to please, but here suddenly you have and you have the uh, the supporters to concern yourself with because if you're not winning some football matches as I didn't do in my early days at Leicester and the Leicester City fans let me know about it as well too <laughs> in no uncertain fashion. Thankfully, I was able to turn that round and I had a, a great relationship with the with the, uh, the Leicester City fans j- during my time there, but not not initially. So, yeah, so from a viewpoint of, of, um, of uh, dealing with the highs and lows, yeah, I, I found... A wee bit more, with possibly a little bit more experience as I got uh, as as a manager, I felt as if maybe I could deal with him. But I might just be saying that, just maybe even to cover myself. Maybe I never really, never really, you know, um, found the answer to it. I'm not so sure that I did, and maybe maybe I haven't even got the answer to it now. Well, what about different personalities, Martin? That you you've you've coached or. I love that. I love the. I that was really interesting, yeah. and really interesting. And you do have a, you know, a, almost every single player you're dealing with had that different. Some somewhere along the way, a different personality to the uh, to the other, the other fellow. Yeah, I I I had genuinely. I I love that aspect of it. Dealing with dealing with characters, dealing with big, uh, dealing with big egos, dealing with lads who had no phenomenal self esteem at all, and that you're trying to bolster them, considering that they might. They they have definite talent, but they don't really believe in themselves. So I loved I loved that. I actually liked occasionally putting the big egos down, particularly in the dressing room. <laughs> I I did enjoy that aspect of it as well too. So um, yeah, all of that there just was uh, was really it's really part of of um, of management, but part of my. I felt that I could deal with those. I didn't. I never felt that there was anybody. That I that well like had insurmountable concerns or something like this. Yeah, of course, when a when a player might come in and wonder why he's not in the team, and you have to deal with a player, if he had a bit of an ego, I really didn't mind telling him he wasn't in the team because he wasn't good enough. But other players who maybe didn't, uh, who maybe couldn't have handled those situations, then you maybe deal with them in a different fashion. I started off. Let me put it this way. I started off in management feeling as if I will treat everyone the same. I'm not so sure that that was the case eventually. But in terms of dealing with big egos then, so you mentioned kind of putting, putting them in their place a little bit. Is that how you kind of work with Mavic yeah, players? Yeah, I did, along didn't, those lines? didn't mind. But you know what? I didn't <clears> mind <throat> players with big egos. So some, uh, where I had a problem with someone having a big ego and not performing on the pitch, yeah. then I felt as if to say, well, that's a sort of a waste of an ego with that, really. I love the players with big egos who performed in the pitch when they did it, when, when they, when they were, when they, when they uh, could, as the top, walk the walk, 
when they could walk the walk, I had the utmost regard for the lads, particularly the boys with the big egos and fine when they did it. It's the lads with the big egos who couldn't walk the walk. You could do talk the talk, you know, but couldn't do the <laughs> other. So that was, and I didn't mind putting them down, uh, I must admit. But um, <laughs> overall, it's, um, yeah, it was just dealing with different personalities. You had, uh, and as I said to you, uh, you started off feeling as if, yeah, I'll deal with all these people the same. But you realise that, that that's not really true. It's interesting because I was speaking to Roy Keane. He was talking about um, about uh, Eric Cantona, you know, the manager. The manager would have a certain number of rules for a, a group of the players and a different set of rules for Eric because Eric was a di different personality. And you have to deal with that. But as long as someone is performing for you in the field, you will you will forgive him that ego if that's the case. Martin, I have to ask you this: What was Hendrik Larsson like as a as a player Henry, to manage? Hendrik was really brilliant footballer, brilliant, brilliant footballer, brave as a lion, could score you goals. And I'm delighted to say that even in the autumn of his career, he goes to he went to Barcelona, helped them win the Champions League. I um I, even though he was uh, maybe not a regular all the time there because they had some Ronaldinho and big big players there, but he he made a difference in the and in, uh, in the European Cup final coming on it was against Arsenal, wasn't it? I yeah, think, you know. Yeah. And um and then he goes to Manchester United and scores goals in the Premier League at thirty four years of age. So I'm delighted because there was this this uh, idea that he could only do it up in Scotland. He was a brilliant brilliant performer. Terrific. One of his best ever games was in the UEFA Cup final against Porto, uh, which we lost 3-2 in extra time in 2003. Uh, he was a brilliant talent. Uh, again, <clears throat> incredibly brave going and would score you a goal and um, and just uh, terrific to work for, uh, to work with, I should say. So you kind of mentioned how you would um, deal with players in terms of leadership I'm, I'm intrigued to to find out how you dealt with owners and how you dealt with people above you so how did you build a relationship with owners I know you obviously had Randy Lerner you had Ellis Shaw you had a, a number of owners as well uh, at other football clubs how did well, you deal I, with ownership yeah, so I'm intrigued, yeah, I, I, I'm intrigued that, on that. That, that has become that has become and over the years and even during my time that has become uh, an essential part of of management, of football management. I, I, I'm, and I think you know what. If the, the more I realise it, it, probably always was, but maybe it didn't have uh, as uh, as much traction, perhaps, as just the manager dealing with with players uh, and um, feeling that he could go maybe go to the occasional board meeting and then you know uh, sort it all out there. No, that's that has become very, very important, very important indeed, because you have to have some sort of relationship with the uh, with the owner or the CEO or whatever it is at the club or the the chairman of the football club. You do have to have it. Unfortunately, you know, I I didn't necessarily always have the um, uh, have that as as um, what shall I say as something that was pressing. I I engaged myself strongly with the football team. But as I learned over the course of time that the relationships and maybe I learned to my my cost that relationships with the uh, the owners or the chairman of the football club has become very, very important, really important. You've got to have a, a line of communication with them uh, nearly all the time. Do you ever look back on that spell at Aston Villa and maybe think to yourself if if the relationship was a little bit more better then there could have been a little bit more progression to get into that top four? I'm just intrigued on, on that because it was public, yes, wasn't yeah, it, I, around that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I've talked about this now. In the, yeah, it's a shame because um, Mr. Lerner and I got on very, very well for a long time uh, together. We did, uh, and um, uh, yes, and in fact, our final year uh, working, we had actually, uh, we uh, finished sixth again for the third consecutive year, got us into Europe, and um and trying to push for the top, for the uh, for the top four, we weren't that far removed from it. And in fact, had uh, had a referee uh, in the League Cup final against Manchester United uh, done the job, um, uh, Phil Dowd, if he had done the job and sent Vidic off after two minutes in the game, I think we would have had uh, won the League Cup against Manchester United. And um, even though they're managed by one of the great managers of all time, and Alex Ferguson. 
But um, I think we could have won that. And that would have been nice to put a trophy there as well too. And uh, and we finished, we finished with more points than we did the previous year. And there was definitely progression. We were in the semi-final of the FA Cup when Chelsea beat us, who went on to win it. And uh, yes, and yeah, I could, I, in hindsight, yeah, you're talking about dealing with things. I, I, I think that, um, I think, um, I think both of us, myself, Mr. Lerner, could have dealt with the situation a wee bit better than we did do. Do you ever, how does that work, Martin, in terms of maybe transfers, etc.? cetera? If you're kind of wanting to recruit players and then the owner might tell you that, Players have to leave, and there's a bit of animosity between the both. How does that work? Yeah, yeah. Does, yeah, that, does that get personal, or I mean, you know, again, I, I, maybe I took things too personally. And I, you know, James Milner was leaving the football club, and I've, I felt that um, sometimes you do take things too personally. Well, other other managers might you'd interview three or four other managers, and they might have a totally different outlook to to myself. But that that was me. I I probably took um, I took some things too personally. You know, really. Um, James Milner, I brought him from Newcastle. I changed him from playing wide right hand side to uh, uh, being a, a centre midfield player. He was a brilliant midfield player for us. And um, but of course, when he was moving to Manchester City, this was going to be a big move for him because we couldn't compete financially uh, with, with them. And uh, so that that uh, it was a bit of a bind. But overall, yeah, I just um, uh, get back to the point. There's some things I could um, definitely in hindsight now, which is a wonderful thing uh, uh, to have. Unfortunately, I'm not, like most people, not blessed with it. And uh, so it would have been nice to have, we weren't that far off. Let me put it this way. We maybe a couple of signings, perhaps. Uh, I didn't think that, um, I didn't think that uh, some of the players playing youth team football uh, were ready to play, step straight in, and um, and become uh, overnight sensations at, at Aston Villa. Uh, I think that that point has kind of been proved, really. Um, and uh, while we had a couple of really fine footballers, Mark Albright and being one of them, um, who goes on to win the uh, the Premier League with uh, with Leicester City, that was great. Um, overall, the players just they weren't ready. We needed we needed if we were going to compete and try and get into the top four, we needed perhaps one or two more um, more senior players. Let me put it this way: at the football club, it wasn't it 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 didn't materialize. It wasn't to be, and it's uh, and it's a bit of a shame. In in terms of maybe you, you mentioned in hindsight, would you ever look back and go, oh, what if? I know football's quite ruthless in 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 industry and in the industry and you can't probably let yourself think like that, but do you ever kind of look back at that experience in Villa and go, we were onto something just if they had a little bit more oh. back in, that could have been a bit better. Yeah. I, I, I think that, I think that anybody, anybody who tells you that they don't look back either are, are remarkable people or just telling fibs. I think that people do. I think that, um, you, uh, in fact, there was a film made called "Was It Sliding Doors" or something, I guess, or whatever it was. And, that, and we all have these moments. Every single one of us that have been brought into this, uh, into this, uh, onto this earth, I should say, have have these sliding doors moments that you feel as if, yeah, what what have we done this again? Uh, can you look back, uh, look back and think, yeah, I, I wish now that really that uh, myself and Mr. Lerner could have patched. Uh, yeah, little differences together, put it and gone for one more big season, which I, you know, in hindsight, I, I should have done. I don't think that, um, I think that, um, I think that, again, I've often thought about it that, uh, Villa, uh, we could have, we could have made the top four definitely. We had the, we had a number of excellent players who were playing at the top of their game at the time. And we just, you know, but it was hard. It was difficult competing with Manchester United and Arsenal, you know, whose spending power was, you know, was uh, was quite uh, quite something else. It was a league apart from us at the time. But you know, we were competing, but we still we were still in there fighting with the Manchester Cities and the Tottenham. This is just probably before Manchester City be exploded into, you know, into uh, uh, into a stratosphere. So, um, but overall, yeah, yeah, of course, everybody has sliding doors moments, and um, and um, I bet you, I'm even talking to a young lad who has them, you know. 
Yeah, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Too young to ruminate over the menu, so don't worry. <laughs> I'm intrigued to to hear how maybe how your management had to change going into international football because, as you mentioned, you know you have a a transfer window where you can recruit players and you've got an academy system where you can bring young players in and you can kind of work work out in terms of selection your selection is a little bit more broader in comparison to international football um how, how would you deal with that in terms of going into international uh, and well, you, well, first of all you, and, you, and, and first of all you know you know you know what it's about you do you know you would have to be really silly not to realize that that international management is you you don't have as you say the power of transfers you have you have to deal with what you have um it's not as if to say that you are going to uh, in three days, in the three days get together, you're going to progress this player that much. You can what uh, in terms of technical ability, but you are going, you can progress them in terms of mentality. And these are things. Are, I mean, when I went to the Republic of Ireland, there was a group of players that essentially, essentially were playing in the championship. Uh, uh, Seamus Coleman being one of the exceptions, but most of the lads were playing in the championship. So the important thing was. That um, that when you had the players for the few days, that you were hoping that you were hoping to um, uh, give them a, a, a belief that they can compete against the Germanys or the the uh, uh, the uh, what shall I say the 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 Swedens the 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 the, the teams of you know the Italys of this world and um, and compete not just compete but get a result against these sides so that was that was really important so the for the couple of days that you did have them you tried to it was really strength of uh, a mental strength as much as anything else trying to impose that into players and also in terms of set pieces you know so even walking through set pieces knowing that you don't have that much time to you know do lots of things with the players generally they're coming in they've already they've played at the weekend they might have a need because their clubs demand that they take a day off the next day or or can't go do too much work so sometimes when you have a, an international game on a Thursday you have very very little time to work with them but you know that as an international manager and as I said to you it's getting those other things right the basically the motivation the strength of character and the mindset that became very, very important, you know, and uh, and obviously uh, set pieces there who which are dominating football at this minute, you know, big matches being won or lost and on set pieces, those are important. So if you could put those together and a sort of a a, a pattern of play that that will suit will suit the players that you have, and that really mm. it's it's those things together. But all of those things, I think that you realize. In terms of your in terms of your management style, I don't think that that changes too much. It really doesn't. What you're going to hopefully to say to the players in, in front of you wearing a green shirt, or what you would have said to the players essentially um, going onto the field for, let's say, Aston Villa or Leicester City or Celtic. Yeah. Do, did you think international football kind of played in your hands? Because you mentioned at the start that you uh, you're very good in terms of. Um, motivation and player relationship. I suppose that kind of worked in your favour in terms of international football and having a number of players for a certain period of time, and then they go back. I, to their you club. Know, no, I I think perhaps maybe maybe I might have been a, of the age where I I wanted to try international management. I uh, really probably did do that, and um, but it's not not something that I'd thought deeply of. You know, I I'd, uh, I'd um, I. Yes, the Republic of Ireland thing definitely intrigued me. I wanted, I did want to manage them as well too, and I felt that um, obviously qualifying for a competition would be top of my agenda, and uh, that's what I wanted to do. The Republic of Ireland, a wee bit like the North of Ireland, don't qualify too often for competitions. So that was that. That was the driving force for me. And when I met the CEO, Mr. Delaney. Um, that was that was top of the agenda to try and qualify for France in in 2016, and hence me the the, the only way that I was going to uh, be uh, get a new contract at um, at uh, the Republic of Ireland uh, was the the one the one uh, feature about it all was that I know that I would definitely get one if we did qualify for France. So that was a driving force, and I was not. I was not uh, there to uh, to um, teach 
teach the senior players how to trap and control the ball. I wouldn't have had, wouldn't have been able to have done that in a day or two's training. If the players can't trap and control the ball, well, maybe they shouldn't be playing international football. Maybe they shouldn't be playing football at all. But what I had there and what I tried to enhance was a top a, a, a spirit within the side as well too. Now, spirit alone doesn't doesn't win your football matches. But if you have a strong strong mentality, strong spirit, and strong camaraderie within the side, it certainly helps. And we had that in abundance there because the players all wanted to play for the Republic of Ireland, and that hasn't changed, thankfully. And that that would have been the same with Mr. Trapattoni, the previous manager. That would have been the same with Jack Charlton, and that would have been the same with um, um, with any of the managers, uh, Mick McCarthy as well. The players want to play, and that's 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 a good start. Uh, and what is Roy Keane like to work with? <laughs> uh, yeah, again, you might not have enough time here in this. Uh, uh, he was very very good. He was very very good indeed. He had been a a, a wonderful footballer, an iconic figure, and uh, and while he had been a manager himself, and that might be difficult when you have been a manager and you've been used to making your own decisions, then sometimes to be an assistant manager uh, can be can be difficult. But he he never, uh, if he ever felt that, he never he never um, he never let me know about it, and uh, and he was really really good to work with. Really good. I enjoyed him immensely, and he was a he was a big part of the success that we had. So, Martin, final part. Um, I'm just intrigued to hear about your book on days like these. How did it come about? And um, if listeners, um, listeners or viewers are are watching or listening to this podcast, could you kind of just give them a little bit of an insight um, in relation to to, to what yeah, uh, the book it, offers? It, yeah. I again, I mentioned to you earlier. I uh, my my career in football has straddled 50 years. I came, you know, it's a long time, certainly a long time with a young man like yourself is listening to that. And um, uh, so I came into the game where uh, only a few years, if you think about it, about six years after England had won the World Cup in 1966, I uh, I played, I played um, under a number of managers, including Brian Clough, had really great success. The seventies, I loved playing football for a start, and you're getting paid, although by today's standards, not as half as much or not not a tenth as much as the boys are getting now. But even so, that didn't bother us, and I I, I could nearly say that collectively for a, a, you know that it didn't really bother us. I think we went into a European Cup final and didn't know what the bonus was uh, for winning. Uh, we loved it. We had a great time. Nottingham Forest was just sensational, and so. And I'm really thankful that I had those days as a player. Then I step into management, so it's covered all that time. I've seen the changes that have taken place in the game, and I probably just wanted to. I wanted to write about it. Um, I perhaps that, uh, and I wanted to write it myself, which is the big thing. I really wanted to do that myself, so I started to write longhand and. Um, and pages and pages of stuff, you know, because I felt that when I'm putting it down in a piece of paper, I can, I, I the recollection is clear to me. That's the point. So overall, this is what I wanted to do. A number of books have been, um, have been there. Supposedly people think they've been autobiographies, but I'd never any, any part of them at all. And so I just probably wanted to, uh, I wanted to put it down. The, um, the good days, the bad days. On days like these, can cover both good and bad. To be perfectly honest, <laughs> and there is a there's a film you will not remember, but Michael Caine. Have you ever heard of Michael Caine as an actor? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, Michael Caine is a brilliant, brilliant actor, and he acted in a film a way back in 1969, 1970 time called The Italian Job, right. and it was um, and um, it was basically, I think, it was a, a heist there in in, in Italy. But there's a song there sung by an old crooner called Matt Monroe, and he sings on days like these. And that's and we took the title for or my wife took the title from that, thought it was really good. And um, and that's hence the name of the title. But to write the book, it was just as I say, spanning the 50 years. I had a bit of time to do it. I enjoyed doing the writing, and hence uh, that's where it's come to. Excellent. What we'll do, Martin, is we'll put the link to your book in the description. So if anyone's listening or watching this, they can they can go and check that out. Um, no problem. No problem. Martin, I just want to kind of conclude and say thank you for your time. Um, from my own personal perspective, growing up as a 
as a Celtic fan and growing up with uh, an Irish background, you've been very influential in terms of my support within football. So thank you for your time and well, not thank at you all. for the good no, moments as well. <laughs> no, good luck with everything. Honestly, good luck with uh, the... Uh... You're doing the PhD, are you? You know, that's this, correct. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Honestly, yeah. well, good luck with all of those things, man. You know, and you look remarkably young for thirty years ago. Well, that's good. That, that, <laughs> Thank that you, helps, man. That helps greatly. You know, because by the time you get to my age, you'll only look uh, thirty-five. <laughs> <laughs> Martin, you thank you so much. No problem. Speak to you soon.